Um, as I customarily do, I'd like to also just acknowledge that um, I'm speaking from uh, the traditional unceded territories of the um, Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam and Squamish nations. Um, I think this is really important. I have learned a lot over the past 10 years since I've been director of the Institute for the Humanities and we've done a lot of events, um, uh, including events that Lena has, uh, has participated in. Um, but we've done a lot of events with um, indigenous peoples, indigenous communities, and um, I've had the opportunity to learn a lot uh, about the experiences of both trauma uh, and resilience and resurgence from elders and, and community members, uh, artists and writers, historians uh, um, from within various indigenous uh, nations. And um, I think that their work has influenced me uh, quite a bit. And, and I think that this project that I'm working on will include um, a significant component of looking at trauma and politics in the indigenous experience because we, we've been going through this um, uh, process of truth and reconciliation about the experience of residential schools where indigenous children were uh, supposed to be transformed into you know uh, assimilated canadians or assimilate into a kind of canadian identity um, and there was physical and sexual abuse and that trauma has stayed with um, these communities uh, for, for some time, but despite that, there's been a tremendous amount of um, resilience, as I mentioned. So, yeah, so these reflections stem from a paper that I presented a few years back um, under the same auspices um, and that uh, Lenny uh, organized for me at the Freud Museum. Um, I think it was actually ended up being in the uh, Anna Freud uh, uh, building for, you know, for some reason there was um, a kind of scheduling uh, issue, but anyway, it was uh, entitled Identifying with the Aggressor from the Authoritarian to the Neoliberal Personality. And it was uh, subsequently published in the critical theory journal based in the United States called Constellations. And it is um, currently a, a book project that, uh, that I'm working on, basically, taking that article and expanding it to book length. And um, in, that, uh, in that lecture, in the paper, I draw upon, amongst others, the insights of uh, uh, Shandor Ferency, and I've been very um, profoundly influenced by the reading of Ferency's work um, by, uh, by Jonathan Sklar, who's with us, and um, Jay Frankel. Um, so my argument was that while the concept of the authoritarian personality from the eponymous study published by Theodore W. Adorno, Daniel Levinson, Elsa Frankel Brunswick, and Nevitt Sanford um, studied the psychological attitudes and dispositions in the immediate post-war period to show a tendency uh, towards obsequious obedience to dominant authority on the one hand and excessive cruelty towards the weak on the other. The insights were profoundly relevant to the subsequent period of capitalism, and this is often referred to as neoliberalism. As Thomas Piketty has shown, um, inequality has been on the rise over the past 40 years. Th so through this period of neoliberalism. Um, and since 2018, we see the top decile, the 10% of the population share in national income um, as 34% in Europe, 41% in China, 46% in Russia, 54% in Sub-Saharan Africa, 55% in India, 56% in Brazil, 64% in the Middle East. In the United States, the figure um, is at 48%, right? So 10% uh, of the population garners 48% of national income. Neoliberalism represents, as David Harvey has argued, a constellation of four interrelated processes, deregulation, privatization, the upward redistribution of wealth, so essentially reversing the gains in the 30 glorious years after the Second World War, and what he calls accumulation by dispossession. This is a kind of updating of what Marx had called primitive accumulation. And there's a logic that connects these discrete elements uh, that form this constellation. Deregulation of various sectors of the economy leads to privatization, and this contributes to the upward redistribution of wealth, 
from the working and middle classes to the wealthy. The accumulation of wealth at the top end of society then leads to, along with luxury consumption and the massive hoarding of cash uh, in offshore bank accounts, for example, in Panama, um, speculation in the real estate market, um, one effect of which is gentrification, through which people, again, working, lower and middle class people uh, lose their housing and are either driven out of the city uh, or rendered homeless. I argue that neoliberalism made explicit and direct what had previously been only implicit and indirect, which was that life under late capitalism, as Theodore W. Adorno uh, argues throughout his masterpiece, Minima Moralia, um, does not live. So life does not live. This is essentially the, the epigram for the whole uh, text. 